Uh, take your Bible, turn to John 19, and um, we are dealing with basically what, what, is, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is it. This is the word of God. This is the gospel. This is what everything in the Bible leading up to was all about. This is what everything after John, Acts, Romans, 1 St. Corinthians, all the way to the book of Revelation, it points back to the cross of Calvary and the, the things that happened to Jesus while he's on the cross and what took place, excuse me, on that day. And uh, I am amazed at the amount of, of um, secondary, what we would call secondary witnesses to the life of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus actually lived and was crucified is, uh, is part of the historical record. Josephus was a, a Roman Jew. He was a citizen of Rome, but he was a Jew and he was a historian. And he wrote the history uh, of the world pertaining to, I guess, the Jewish people in the Roman Empire uh, all the way up until his time. And um, he had mentioned several things about Jesus Christ and so on and, and the, the, the biblical reality that Jesus actually did exist. Uh, he, did, he was crucified on the cross. Um, I read a book when I was in Bible college uh, by Josh McDowell who wrote um, uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And it was basically an apologetic of Christianity. And he wrote a book after that called The Resurrection Factor. And he laid out... Uh, all the evidence for uh, the, uh, the basis of the resurrection of Christ. And he said, if you, were to, if you were to bring this evidence into a courtroom, here's what it would look like. And if you were going to have a jury decide on whether or not the, the record was accurate or not, you would be, the jury would be forced to vote in favor of the, the resurrection of Christ. In other words, that Christ truly was dead there's no doubt about that whatsoever. And that uh, after he died, he rose again. And the Bible says that he was seen of above 500 witnesses. So he, imagine a lawyer who has a case that's so well put together that he has the ability to bring in 500 witnesses, individual witnesses who actually saw Jesus Christ alive after he was crucified on the cross. And mind you, he's, as part of his trial, he's going to bring in the official Roman records of the day. The fact that Pontius Pilate went ahead and authorized his crucifixion. The fact that he was crucified, I'm sure was written down in some record somewhere there uh, under Pontius Pilate. Um, the fact that the Bible states that Pilate made sure that nobody interfered with the grave that Jesus was in. So he had Roman soldiers stand guard and he put his seal upon that tomb. So that if that seal ever got broken, then Pilate knows somebody messed with this thing. The fact that the Roman soldiers who uh, went to sleep, they, the angel, they, I guess they passed out or whatever. When the angel rolled the stone back and Jesus came out, those Roman soldiers were under penalty of death if they, if, they, um, if they admitted what they admitted. They admitted to Pontius Pilate, hey, we, we were like knocked out. We don't know what happened. And so the story was told to them, listen, you guys, we will kill you. If you say that he actually resurrected, you, you're going to say that his people came and, uh, and, and did all that themselves and they stole the body away. And they were, under, they were under penalty of death, but they told the truth. And so there's so many historical things valid there for the crucifixion of Christ, the fact that he died, he was dead three days, he rose again on the third day, and he was seen for the next, well, it's 50 days from Passover... So he was seen 50 days up until the, uh, no, he didn't, he didn't go to heaven on Pentecost, did he? No, uh -uh. it was before that, 40 days, I'll say. But anyway, 
So the fact that Christ was alive after his death is a historical fact. And so you'd be hard, you have to really be a diehard atheist to rewrite that history is what you, you, you can't have that story messing with your version of history. So that's why they rewrite it. That's why they say that it never happened and, and it was all made up by his disciples and so on and so on. Uh, the conversation that uh, the uh, Sanhedrin had in the days after Christ arose and went to heaven uh, there with uh, Peter and John and the conversation that they had, they said, you know, hey, you remember this guy and he, he was supposed to be some, some Messiah dude and he had his followers and then, you know, he was killed and all of his followers, they split the scene. I'm sure they didn't speak quite like that, but... Anyway, they're saying, you know, if we just leave these guys alone, this thing will go away. But if it doesn't, and this really is of God, then we don't want to be guilty of standing against God. We don't want that. And so that was about the smartest guy on the whole committee, if you ask me. But anyway, all right, uh, let's start reading again. John chapter 19, verse 1. Uh, which is what we covered uh, last Wednesday night, but let's, let's work our way down. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. The soldiers platted a crown of thorns. We looked at the symbolism of thorns in the Bible. Put it on his head. They represent sin. They represent devils. The kingdom of Satan. Uh, it's the sting of death and so on. Uh, and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. So basically, he's innocent. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto him, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Talk about a political move. That was a political move, pure and simple. Pilate did not want to be seen by Caesar as being out of control or having Palestine out of control. He, he had his governorship over Palestine. Pontius Pilate did. He doesn't want a report going back to Caesar saying that he lost control of, of the Jewish people and there was an uprising there while he's governor because he knows he'll lose his lofty position, his nice, comfortable job. He'll lose all of that. So it is expedient for Pilate to crucify Christ. Could God have stopped Pontius Pilate? Absolutely. This is something that, who remembers the Reverend Sun Myung Moon? Who remembers hearing about him? Am I the only one? It was the Unification Church. It was out of Korea, South Korea. And there was a, um, uh, a, a guy out there, him and his wife. Uh, he built this big, large cult out there. And we called them the Moonies because... Back then, people, these groups like that used to proselytize at airports. Now, I just, I, I guess they don't let them anymore or what. But they used to proselytize people at the airports. The Moonies were there, the Mormons were there, whatever. And um, the Reverend Moon taught his people that Christ failed when he came that he was not supposed to be killed. So Christ failed, so God sent the Reverend Moon to take his place. See, that's, that's the first thing you look for out of any suspected cult is, does the leader take the place of Jesus Christ? Somehow, some way, that guy's gonna take the place of Christ. Well, lo and behold, the Catholic Church, they named the Pope the Vicar of Christ. In other words, he's Christ on this earth. And what he says goes. Even if the Bible contradicts him, which it does hundreds of times, thousands of times. But 
he's, he's Christ now on this earth. So what he says, that's law. So anyway, Pilate did this purely for political reasons. Take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Verse 7, the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now we found that in Leviticus 24, 17. Do you remember last Wednesday what it was that they were violating the very law that they were referring to? Do you remember what it was? They were supposed to stone Jesus for blasphemy. But that's not what they were doing. They were breaking the law because the punishment wasn't the right punishment. So that tells you right there and indicates to you right there that Christ was destined from before the foundation of the world, that his death was not going to be by stoning. His death was not going to be by beheading. His death was going to be by crucifixion. Plain and simple. Uh, and so they have a law because he made himself the son of God. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. And Father, just give us food, Lord, for the next few days. And we thank you, God, for all that you do and all that you've done in our lives. And Father, we pray, Lord, for the people of Israel, for the nation of Israel. Father, we pray, dear God, for our nation, that we not waver in our blessing of the people of Israel. And Father, I don't care if it's a congresswoman. I don't care if it's a university president. I don't care if it's all the universities in the country put together that are wanting the absolute destruction, the total annihilation of the Jewish people. Lord, Father, we'll stand with Israel if we have to stand alone. So, Father, Lord, bless your people. And bring them to salvation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in verse 8, uh, the Bible says, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, uh, let's see here, did we, did we end in verse 7? Yeah. The saying was, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. So Pilate there in verse 8, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Which essentially means, where do, you, where do you come from? How did you get here? But Jesus gave him no answer. Remember, we read in, in Isaiah 53 last Wednesday night that according to the prophecy, he is led as a lamb before his shearers, but he's dumb. Meaning, he's not speaking. Jesus gave no answer answer in his defense he knew that it must happen his crucifixion his death on the cross must take place so he is not going to give an answer in his defense whatsoever he didn't he in fact he says nothing so verse 10 then saith Pilate unto him speakest thou not unto me Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? And pay attention to verse 11. Especially anybody listening to me, hearing my voice, who believes that if there's an unrighteous, lost, heathen sinner who is a congressman or a judge or a president, well, God has nothing to do with that. God doesn't put the heathen in, in charge. Oh, yes, he does. Oh, yes, he does. God reigns over every nation in the world. God is the one who elects, selects, uh, gives a throne to, takes a throne away from. God is the one who does this. And make no mistake about it. We have too many people, and I get it, they don't like who the president is, they don't like who uh, the last president was, or they didn't like the presidents before them, and, 
And they're all in the Illuminati and they're all Freemasons. And I don't have to, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to obey them. Yeah, you do. Inasmuch as they do not cause you to violate God's law, then you must obey governors, magistrates, kings, queens. We have to, we have to live under government. We have to. And so Jesus, verse 11, says it. Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Jesus himself knew. He was the king of kings and lord of lords. He didn't have to, he didn't have to say anything to Pilate. He didn't have to bow to him. He didn't have to do anything he says. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus doesn't even have to be crucified if he doesn't want to. Remember what he prayed the night before. Father, to be any other way, let this cup pass from before. By the way, I was, we were singing that song a while ago. Um, what was it It said about two life sparkling cup? Something about chasing after life's sparkling cup. And I was thinking about that. Trust only in his love, kneel at the cross. Life's sparkling cup, I, there is a, there's a cup in the Bible. You, you can find it as you go all the way through scriptures. There is a cup of blessing. There's a cup of, with curses in it. There's a cup, there's the cup of Christ and the cup of devils. Okay? And we know the cup of Christ is the gospel of our salvation. So the cup of devils is going to be the false gospel. It's going to be, have something to do with uh, the opposite of what the gospel is. It's going to have something to do with uh, turning people into immortals or gods or whatever. Um, but anyway, um, I was just thinking about that when I, when I read this. He, when he prayed, let this cup pass from before me. But he submitted to God's will. And so he's there before Pilate, and he says to Pilate, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Christ is telling us that if they're in charge, God put them there. God put Pharaoh, the Pharaoh that brought the Israelites into bondage, God is the one who raised up that Pharaoh. The Bible is very clear on this one. The Pharaoh that... Um, survived nine out of the ten plagues, God put him in charge. The Pharaoh that finally released the children of Israel, God put that Pharaoh in charge. The Pharaoh that finally woke up and said, why did I let those Jews go? The Bible specifically says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and that caused Pharaoh to get up take his 600 chariots and go chasing after the Jews. He was going to kill every one of them. He wasn't going to bring them back to sleep. He was going to kill them. And God is the one who manipulated the heart of Pharaoh to do exactly what was in God's plan. So to me, it's a, it's a foolish idea to think that God only wants the righteous being kings and queens and governors and presidents and senators and leaders and things like that. God uses them all for his plan, his purpose to fulfill prophecy. God uses all of it. So Jesus lets Pilate know, Pilate, the very reason why you're in charge here is because God put you in charge here. And if, if you think that you can kill me without God's permission, you're wrong. You have no power over me except God give it to you. And so uh, he says, thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Who delivered Jesus to Pilate? Huh? Wait, who did he say? Mary. Mary. No. 
Well, she delivered Jesus in birth, but she didn't deliver him to Pilate. Uh, we got Judas. Okay, his was the greater sin. The Jews, the Jewish people, the Sanhedrin, theirs was the greater sin. Uh, verse 12, and from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar. See, they knew how to pull that Caesar string, didn't they? Uh, we're going to tell Caesar, if you don't do what we want, we're going to start an uprising. You don't want that on your record. We'll tell Caesar. He'll take you out, put somebody else in. So thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. And so that's all Pilate needed to hear. He's, he's a typical low-level politician is what he is. All you need to do is speak their language. And they'll do what you want them to do. That's all you got to do is speak politics and they'll do it. Uh, so in verse 13, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth, sat down in the judgment seat in a place called, in a, in a place that is called the pavement. It was like a, a court area. And it's where we get the word court from when you go to court. Um, it dates back to this time when literally most trials were held out in a courtyard outside so that everybody could hear what was going on. So they have this paved area here and that's the place where his judgment seat is. Pilate's going to sit and he's going to judge now over this particular trial in this court. So it's called the pavement. Uh, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover. Why? Because Jesus is Passover. He is the lamb that, was, that is going to be slain. It is going to be his blood that is going to atone for the sins of mankind. And that when God sees his blood, he will pass, literally pass over all of the sinners that are in that house who put themselves under, listen to this, under the protection of the blood. A former pastor of mine, first pastor I had in this church, I thought he was a good guy. I really did. I grew up with these rose-colored glasses of all these people that I knew. And about 20 years or so ago, he wrote, he, he left here to go take a teaching job at a new Bible college that was being started up uh, over in, uh, I think it's South Carolina. And he was going to be a professor of Greek and teach uh, the students Greek and so on, among other things. Well, he wrote a, he wrote a paper that basically followed John MacArthur's bloodless salvation. John MacArthur is the one who made this notorious and this pastor, A.B. Brown, uh, followed in his footsteps. He basically said that the blood of Christ is not really what's essential for salvation of man. It's the death of Christ that was important. And so what he said was, he used the phrase metonym, which means like a metaphor, only using a particular word or a phrase. He said, anytime you have blood mentioned, especially in the New Testament, it's a metonym for death. It, it literally means death. And so basically, as you're reading the Bible, when you see the word blood, you're supposed to think in your mind, death. Now, what authority does he say that on? His own. His own authority. There's no verse in the Bible that tells you that. Not one passage that tells you that. When you read just the Bible, you get the exact opposite. You get the idea that it's the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. That God, this is what Paul said, God, with his own blood, purchased the church. And so he, he denied that Christ's blood was divine. And he said his blood is no more divine than, and he said this, any, any of his other bodily fluids like his spit or his sweat. And it's like, 
I am, because I was going to have this guy preach uh, like a 30th anniversary homecoming that we had here. And by the way, we had a good time because he wasn't here. I brought in Preacher Golf, the, the one I uh, surrendered to the call of the ministry under. And boy, I mean, he preached it good. Um, but I was, I was thinking seriously about calling him in and letting him preach. And when I found out that he trampled on the blood, I said, he'll never, ever preach here. Never happen. And so uh, just those of you who, who think John MacArthur is an okay guy, don't. Don't, don't John MacArthur anything, okay? Um, so anyway, uh, it was preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest, now this, yeah, and you just want to see some guy's blood pressure go up. The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Those Jews hated Caesar. They hated Rome. They hated the fact that Rome had authority over them. We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull. Which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. Let me stop right here for a minute. I wish I'd paid more attention to this and, and thought about this. Um, one, of the, one of my areas of, of interest, in fact, I, I bought another magazine. It was National Geographic. Uh, they were selling it at the checkout stand at Walmart this evening. And it was a whole issue on secret societies. Well, I snatched that thing up. Because one area of interest of mine is in the language of symbols. Symbols speak things. Um, and any time someone deliberately uses a skull as a symbol to put it on a product or just because it looks neat or they've got it on their guitar where they're playing Stairway to Heaven on or whatever, the skull is always going to be a representation of death because the skull it, it with it if it has no tissue on it, it has no skin on it if it, it if it's just sitting there by itself you know it's not alive it is always a symbol of death when ezekiel looks out over the the uh, the field there and he sees dry bones he's seeing skulls and arm bones and leg bones there and that's a symbol for death uh, both, it, it came out in the, um, what was it, the 2004 election when, jo when George Bush was running against John Kerry, came out that both of them went to Yale University and both of them were members of a secret society called the Skull and Bone Society. And George Bush wrote in his biography, autobiography, he wrote a chapter, a whole chapter on Skull and Bones. And he said, it was at Yale that I became a member of a secret society called the Skull and Bone Society. It is so secret, I cannot write anything else. That was the end of that chapter. It was like three sentences, and then it's the next chapter. They're not telling nothing. But him and John Kerry, both members of the same secret society. And in this secret society, you have the top people in business. You have the top people in politics, the top people in banking. I mean, these, this secret society advances its own members and puts them in top places so that they can control what goes on with some, some amount of success. And uh, so anyway, so the place of a skull, that the symbolism of a skull is always going to be a symbol for death. So the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha, it has another name. What is, what is that other name? It's called Golgotha and what? Huh? Calvary. Yeah, you got it. Way to go. Calvary. Where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. Where's my notes at for tonight? Yeah, I want to get to this. Look at verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments 
made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout in other words this was this was kind of pricey and you don't want to cut that up i mean that's a good that's a good coat so they said therefore among themselves let us not rend it but cast lots for it whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled underline that phrase in your bible i promise you everybody everybody here everybody there listening to me what happens in your life good or bad all of it in some way fulfills scripture see the bible's not just written solely about the life of one man jesus christ he's the focus of everything in scripture but he's not the only part this bible when it's called the book of life i believe that it's the book of your life i find in this book everything that's ever happened to me right here right here good or bad it's in here the bible talks about a book of blessing and and the, the right the blessings and the cursings in it well in in the book in my life there's been the good and the bad the blessings and the cursings um in my dna i've got blessings and cursings written in there i've got things in my DNA that are keeping me alive right now. But I've got things probably in my DNA that one day it may rise up and kill me. You know how they say, you know, this runs in their family, heart disease runs in their family or cancer runs in their family or whatever. That's true. It's, it's genetic and we pass it down, you know, to people and those, the good things and the bad things are all written in my DNA. You learn to accept that. You'll get along a whole lot better in life. Understanding that everything that happens with you, God ordained it. And it will fulfill scripture. So whenever you have a question, don't understand why this happened, don't understand why that happened, don't understand why... Bad things happen when, you know, years ago or bad things happen yesterday or whatever. It's part of a plan. Part of God's lot process. He gives you how he wants your life to go and your life is going to go that way. And he knows it. And he knows that it's going it, to, it's either going to lead you to the cross or it's going to drive you away from it. But it's according to God's plan that the scripture might be fulfilled. Remember what, I, what, what I've taught you about your DNA. That at the moment you're conceived, everything about you is already written out. Okay? Uh, <laughs> it was one of these, um, I don't know, one of these uh, TV shows where they got judges. It wasn't Judge Judy. But there was a, a black woman there and a, and the she was being sued by this guy her husband i think and he said the baby's not mine and then they showed a picture of the baby it was white well the guy was black the guy was black the gal was black but she has a white baby it don't take it don't take somebody going to law school to figure that one out the judge said that ain't your baby it's pretty simple. Well, why couldn't, why couldn't that change? Because it's written down. It's written in the DNA. Okay? And DNA does not lie. Did you hear that, all you liberals? DNA doesn't lie. 
If it's an X chromosome, it's an X chromosome. If it's a Y chromosome, it's a Y chromosome. I feel like going Y, X. It doesn't lie. I wanted to say, I, I thought about it later, but in that, when I went to that, um, that boy at, at Hillsborough School that put a dress and a wig on, and he was being interviewed, given all these softball questions. I had him right on camera. And I asked him point blank, I said, would it be, uh, is it wrong for any of the males in the school to go into the girls' bathroom? And he said, it would be wrong for any boy to go in the girls' bathroom. And he looked right at the camera and said, I am not a boy. And if I'd have thought about it, I would have said, well, you got a Y chromosome. That means you're a boy. You cannot escape that. So I, don't, I don't know what's happened. It'd be interesting to find out what his life is like now. But anyway, uh, the scripture has to be fulfilled. What's in your DNA is going, to be, is going to be fulfilled. It's going to happen. Okay? If you're supposed to be five foot two, you're going to be five foot two. Instead of six three. Okay? And that's just how it is. It's because it was written out by a loving, wise God, and he wrote in there everything that you're to be. Now, does that mean you don't have a choice in anything? No, it doesn't. When it comes to this important issue, whether to heaven or hell, you have that choice. You choose, okay? But anyway, the scripture might be fulfilled, which say, if they parted my raiment among... Turn to Psalm 22 while I'm reading this. They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now again, an argument is, is put forth that Christ manipulated, uh, what do they call it, a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, they accuse Christ of knowing what the Old Testament said about the Messiah and then doing things that make him look like he's the fulfillment of that. While he may have been able to know in Psalm 22, a thousand years earlier, David writes this. While Jesus may have been able to remember the words that were spoken in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He doesn't have control over what the Roman soldiers do. He doesn't have control. Remember, we found out that according to the law, he's to be stoned. But it is purposed that he's going to be crucified. The, the Jewish people want him crucified. Pilate wants him crucified. The people want him crucified. And God wants him crucified. He's not going to be killed by stones. He's going to be crucified. So Jesus didn't have a choice on how his death was to take place. And he didn't have a choice over what the Roman soldiers were going to do at the foot of that cross. He doesn't have a choice. When we read Psalm 22, look at verse 5. They cried unto thee and, and were delivered. And they trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Well, that is... Almost word for word, what the people said as Christ is on the cross. Christ doesn't have any control over that either. In fact, the, the, the point of any leader um, es establishing himself as the one and only is that he wants everybody to follow him. It doesn't make sense to purposely have people say, He's an idiot, he's crazy, he's not God's son. He doesn't have any control over that. And so here are the people at the foot of the cross saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him come down. Okay? But God's not, God didn't deliver them, so see, he's not God's son. And then in verse 16, dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. He didn't have any control over that. He had no control whatsoever on how they crucified him, whether they tied him there or they used nails to fasten him there. He said, verse 17, I may tell all my bones. Not a bone of him was broken. That, that's not here, but 
It's a fulfillment of prophecy that none of his bones were broken. He didn't have any control of that either because the soldiers were going around to break the legs. They, I mean, everybody was tired of being there all day long and they were going to break the bones, the leg bones of the guys on the cross to hurry up and facilitate. The, if you can't push up with your legs, then you have to collapse on your outstretched arms. That collapses your lungs and you're going to die of cardiac arrest. Okay? And that's just, how, that's just how it's going to go. You're going to basically crush your heart with the fluid that's building up around it. And that's, that's the, the death of crucifixion. It just literally destroys your lungs and your heart. Christ doesn't have any control over that. But they did not break his legs. Why? He died before the soldiers went to break his leg. When they got to him, they're going, well, he's already dead. So that fulfills scripture. Then verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Again, written a thousand years before Christ. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, my, O my strength, haste thee to help me. All of these things written down, and, and it's like I said, if, if David would have went out, instead of writing Psalm 22, if he would have taken a bow and arrow, and he wrote down, 1,000 years from now, on the second month, the 17th day of the month, 9 a.m. in the morning, or let's say we'll call it the sixth hour of the day, this arrow that I shoot today will kill a dove that is flying by the western side of Herod's temple, signed David. <laughs> Shoots an arrow. And the arrow goes around the earth a thousand years. And a thousand years later, six hours of the day, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the arrow comes down over Jerusalem. A dove begins, leaves this tree, flies over in front of the western part of Herod's temple, and the arrow shot a thousand years later, hits the dove right in the eyes, kills it. That's some shot. Amen? That's better than me hitting a deer with a Buick. Okay? It, it, it was a Buick Skylark that I, that I used. Yeah, it was a Buick Skylark. Anyway. Um, that's, that's what you've got here. That's what you've got. When somebody writes these things down and you look a thousand years later, what Isaiah wrote, what David wrote, what's written in the law and how all of that is fulfilled at Calvary. It's absolutely stunning how these things get fulfilled all these years later and we can't even I, I can't even tell you what I'm going to be doing with any accuracy this time tomorrow night I can guess but I can't tell you for sure I can't even tell you what I'm what I'm going to be doing in 15 minutes from now I cannot tell you that okay but when God writes it he's already seen it God sees all of human history, past, present, future, all at once, nothing is a mystery to him. And John, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to wait on this. If you look here at that verse, verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by, the disciple, he says it like this, the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is that? Okay. Shh. Don't tell Derek. I want Derek to find out on his own. Well, of course you can say that now. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll look at that next Wednesday night. All right. Um, yeah, yeah, boy, oh boy. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Not, he said he was the king of the Jews. 
He's accused of being the king. The king of the Jews. Okay? It's not an accusation. It's a statement. Amen? It's the gospel. Amen. All right. Um, prayer requests. Pray for Roy. Blood pressure. It's blood pressure day for Roy. Al, yeah, I have not heard from Al in a while. So Al may be iron doming. Okay, uh, Al helped put that together. That makes that puts him on my cool list. Okay, because literally uh, that iron dome has a like a ninety some odd percent success rate at at hitting any missile that they send over Israeli territory, okay? And uh, pray for, um, what's her name? Uh, Shalib, the, she's a congresswoman. She got censured today. 22 Democrats voted to censure her because she said, from the river to the sea. You know what that is? They're going to drive the Jews from the Jordan River into the Mediterranean Sea. She said that. That's, a, that's like a, a saying now. And that, that goes all the way back to Yasser Arafat. That goes way back, years and years and years. But she put that out, that that's what she wants. And then she tried to say, get this, she tried to say in her defense uh, at her trial in Congress, she tried to say, that it's not a statement of death. It's a statement of unifying everybody. Baloney! You liar! They ought to censure you for just talking. Excuse me, you're talking. Shut up. Uh, and li these, these, these college liberals, they're all saying the same thing from the river to the sea, the river to the sea. And I'm like, when are people going to wake up? When are Jews going to wake up in this country? When are these liberal Jews going to wake up and say, uh, at, listen, uh, everybody's calling for your death. Do you not remember a guy named Hitler? I mean, this, I am seriously concerned for my country because that is exactly how it started in Germany. Blame the Jews. Blame the Jews for everything. And when you make them out to be the bad guys, then you don't feel guilty when you have them killed. Your conscience is seared. And I am, I am very concerned for my country. They ought, they, I listen, that, that's, not, that's not free speech. They call that hate speech. Well, it's the Jews, though, so we can, we can say that. It's the Jews. The Jews are bad. Yeah, right. How long did the, how long uh, at that protest did the, um, the rainbow flag last? They had, a, they had a protest somewhere, and somebody pulled out the rainbow flag, and they just, it lasted about one minute. And they tore it down. Because the Palestinians, they're all Muslims and they don't put up with that. So, yeah, you've got, you know, what? maybe, I don't know, maybe God, that's not such a bad idea to put liberals against liberals. <laughs> and it'd be like in the Jehoshaphat's battle. Let them all kill, the, let them all kill each other. You know, hey, <sighs> I don't mean that. <laughs>